go over um, the content for exam three via Quizlet. And I know you guys like this, so I'm going to keep this up. Um, <clears throat> so first, I'm going to talk about urinary and renal conditions. Then I'll go into the GI and biliary tree. Now, this exam has a lot, a lot of content on it. So do not wait until the last minute to study. I took off any questions on the exam about glomerulonephritis and nephrotic syndrome. And the reason I did that is glomerulonephritis, first of all, is an acute kidney injury. And the only difference is it's an intrarenal kidney di disease. And the only difference is they're going to have red, rusty urine or tea-colored urine, but it essentially is an acute kidney injury which I will be going over in a different Quizlet. Uh, nephrotic syndrome is a little bit different. However, you are going to be taught both of these conditions in uh, 120 in pediatrics, okay? So I didn't want to duplicate because there's so much information already in this exam. So I know you're sad about that, but I've left the lectures up for you on SoundCloud and also in my PDFs, in case you want to go back and see it. I have a Quizlet, but um, it's not in your Exam 3 folder, if you wanted to look at that too. All right, so let's get on with it. I'm going to talk about lower UTI first, and then move to upper. So there are three conditions that comprise a lower UTI. Cystitis, uritis, and prostatitis. prostatitis. So you don't really need to know the difference between them because they all have the sim similar symptoms, okay? So what puts somebody at risk for a UTI? Women are more at risk because of the shorter urethra. Postmenopausal women or women with uh, low estrogen levels. Uh, synthetic underwear because it causes bacteria to grow down there. Um, bowel incontinence, that's pretty obvious, right? Anybody with diabetes because they're at risk for a vacation. Um, infection anyway. Anybody with an indwelling catheter, and it's the duration of the catheter that puts them more at risk. That's why we try to get indwelling catheters out as soon as possible. All right, anybody with neurogenic bladder and older adults are at risk. So why do you need to know who's at risk? Because you need to be able to apply this information in a situation. You need to be thinking about your patients and what is in their history that could put them at risk for a UTI. The most common bacteria that causes a UTI is E. coli. It's the same for upper and lower. The cues that point to a UTI, you can remember the mnemonic fun wise, or you can just remember the symptoms, okay? So they're gonna have frequency and urgency, uh, nocturia and nasty smelling urine, W is for weak stream, and that's usually with prostatitis, but it's okay. Intermittency and itching, the perineal itching. They could have straining. Some sexually transmitted uh, infections can cause the same signs and symptoms as a UTI. And E is for emptying incompletely. So they feel like they're voiding in small amounts so they can't empty their bladder. Okay. Now, what you would anticipate the urinalysis to show in a UTI is it would be positive for leukocyte esterase, which is a byproduct of white blood cells. And you shouldn't see white blood cells in somebody's urine. So if somebody has white blood cells or red blood cells in their urine, you know they're in, they have a UTI. Positive nitrates, is um, that's a byproduct of E. coli. So that means there's, you know, E. coli ca is causing the infection. Um, if there's any bacteria in urine, you're not supposed to have. Urine is sterile. It's supposed to be sterile when it comes out. Um, possible increase or decrease in the pH of the urine. So if the urine has a normal pH, you're not going to think they have a uh, UTI. Now, with older adults, you already know this, they're going to um, they're going to present with new confusion. Um, they may be incontinence for the first time, and they'll have nocturia. Now, what we don't want, you want to recognize this early in an older adult especially because they're going to be really prone to urosepsis, which you're going to see tachycardia, tachypnea, a temperature, and then when they become septic, they'll get hypotension, okay? 
The medications used to treat macrodantin is used for, P, um, for UTIs, and this could cause hepatotoxicity, so LFTs may be uh, elevated. Cephalosporins, you know, they're very closely related to penicillins, um, so check for allergies because they could have a cross-reaction. Cipro, there are a lot of nursing considerations with Cipro. Cipro, so you want to take it two hours before or six hours after an antacid or iron preparation. Um, sometimes as a nurse, it's hard to manage all these meds because there are specifications like that and <clears throat> it's easy to, to miss it. Uh, avoid caffeine. Anybody with the UTI needs to drink two to three liters per day, but especially on Cipro. Now, it may cause a false positive in opioid screening test, so you can ask if they're applying for a job or nursing school. This was recently a topic of um, discussion on one of my nursing forums because um, the dean was asking what they do about that. And how I would handle it is I would just have the student do another drug test after they're off the medications. Um, explain to report ankle tenderness because... Ciprofloxin and um, the quinolones, it's, you know, it's in the quinolone family, um, they can cause Achilles tendon defects or injury. So they need to report ankle ten tenderness. And also, they're going to be photosensitive. So they're going to be at risk for sunburn. Now, don't get photosensitivity confused with photophobia. Photophobia is when... Um, light hurts the eyes, like you can't see in bright light, okay? That's photophobia, phobia meaning your eyes, right? Whereas photosensitivity is, um, you know, is, uh, fun, um, is a risk after about going in the sun, all right? So don't confuse with other medications. Photosensitivity makes you at risk for sunburn, okay? A client develops uticaria when an antibiotic is fusing, you got to stop the infusion right away. Absolutely stop that and call the physician, get a new drugs um, ordered. Um, <clears throat> if you have a patient on antibiotics that gets diarrhea, you're going to have to, um, you know, you let the provider know, but you'll have to send three stool samples at different times to the lab for OBA and parasites. Um, and then your nursing instructions. For somebody that has a UTI, you want all patients to finish antibiotics. You want people to empty their bladder every three to four hours. Don't hold it, which we do as nurses, right? Um, you want them to void before and after sex. Encourage fluids. Um, Cranberry-based products, that's like an herbal um, remedy to prevent UTIs. Uh, cis baths and hot water bottles. Uh, wipe from front to back. Don't get turned around on exams either. But they need to wipe front to back. All right. No bubble baths. No sit in wet bathing suits. Um, wear the right kind of underwear and don't wash your underclothing in strong detergents. Nowadays, there's a lot of smelly stuff. You know, those beads you can put into your laundry. So just be very careful with those kind of things because it may irritate um, the areas. Okay, so I'm going to talk about upper UTIs, and when I say upper UTI, I'm talking about pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is <clears throat> a bacterial infection that happens usually, you know, they have a lower UTI, and the bacteria climbs up the ureters into the kidneys, all right? In this picture right here, this is somebody uh, percussing or palpating the costal vertebral angle. People with upper UTIs have tenderness in the costal vertebral angle. And this is a defining characteristic because a lot of the signs and symptoms of pyelonephritis are the same as a lower UTI. All right, so the chronic result pyelonephritis, this, this happens in people who get repeated infections. And the people who get repeated infections are people like with spinal cord injuries because well, oftentimes they're laying flat. Um, also, people with structural abnormalities. Anyways, the chronic form is going to eventually turn into chronic kidney disease, and that's really all you need to know about that. All right, the risk factors for acute pyelonephritis include 
women 20 to 30 years old who are not voiding before and after sex, people on bed rest and immobility. And the reason they have acute pyelonephritis because there's reflux of urine into the renal pelvis, all right? Um, with acute pyelonephritis, it only occurs in one kidney, and with chronic, it occurs in both. So they're going to have all those sy symptoms of a lower UTI. So these are going to be um, the symptoms that are similar to a lower UTI. Now, the symptoms that are different in pyelonephritis, the big one is CVA tenderness. Okay, And I already talked about, um, you know, with older adults, they could have fever, chills, tachycardia, and tachypnea. And once they get a low BP, we worry about urosepsis. All right, again, same thing. The older adults with pyelonephritis may present with the same symptoms as they would with a lower UTI. You differentiate between a lower UTI and an upper UTI by um, the CVA tenderness. It's only present in pyelonephritis and not in like lower UTIs. All right. Um, the most common organism, again, is E. coli. What will the urinalysis show? The same thing as a UTI. So you're going to see white blood cells. You may see some casts. Leukocyte esterase will be present. Nitrates will be present. They'll have bacteria. They could have a little sediment because, remember, it's in the upper kidneys, okay, not just in the bladder, okay. They may have RBCs and hematuria and positive nitrates. So that's what you're going to see in the um, UA. Um, okay, so these are the type of tests they would do. So a BUN, uh, I mean a KUB, sorry, a KUB is kidneys, ureter, and bladder x-ray. So the nursing implications is make sure women aren't pregnant and they need to take off their jewelry. With a CAT scan or an IV pyelogram, these are, are exams with um, contrast dye. You need to make sure the patient's not on metformin because remember, you need to hold it 24 hours before, 48 hours after. You also need to check the BUN and creatinine for anybody having these tests and let the provider know if they're elevated because the risk of the contrast eye is that you could um, give a patient an acute kidney injury by giving them the contrast eye. So you need to watch out for that. Now the cystoureterogram, that uses contrast eye, but the thing is it doesn't get absorbed. They put the contrast eye into the bladder and they take pictures while the patient is voiding, so it's non-absorbable. So you don't have to worry about all those nursing implications I just talked about. Renal scan is safe for somebody with renal problems. A renal scan is a test in nuclear medicine, and they would do it to see what the glomerular filtration rate is or to see what the perfusion to the kidneys are like. All right, lab findings. They're going to have an elevated WBC with the shift to the left. That means they're going to have increase in their bands. I don't know if you remember that from Med Surge 1. They'll have an increase in their BUN and creatinine and their inflammatory markers will be elevated. All right, what labs should the nurse check for a patient undergoing a diagnostic test with contrast medium, B1 and creatinine? Creatinine is always gonna be more sensitive, so if you ever get a choice between the two, you're gonna pick creatinine, because the BUN can be elevated, like if somebody ate too much protein, for like a lot of different reasons, I'm just trying to point out. But the creatinine is constant. So you're going to use the creatinine always if you get a choice between the two. You need to hold metformin. Um, repeated UTIs can cause chronic pyelonephritis. Um, Perididine. Okay, you need to know this is a urinary analgesic. It's given to relieve the pain of urinary tract, either upper or lower urinary tract infections. To evaluate if it's working, you are going to ask the patient, if the pain is relieved while they're voiding. Now, it's two very different things because you also need to tell them that it's going to turn their or urine orange. So they need to watch out for that. Um, and they can be prescribed acetaminophen for the fever. We don't like to give aspirin to people that have uh, renal problems. And then the nurse should encourage the patient to drink at least two liters a day if it's not contraindicated.
because you know in some older adults it could be contraindicated. The medications that are nephrotoxic and ototoxic include your aminoglycosides, so your myosins, remember that, your loop diuretics, um, aspirin, methotrexate, cisplatinum, and NSAIDs. And if you ever have a question about a nephrostomy tube, you never clamp a nephrostomy tube, okay? That's just so the, because you can cause a hydronephrosis uh, with that. And I have that on um, one of my PDFs. All right, now I'm going to talk about benign prosthetic hyperplasia. This is a benign growth of cells within the prostate gland. And it, it, it occurs in um, people that were born male at birth. So remember now, if a male tra transitions to a female, they often leave the prostate in. So somebody that has transitioned to female, you got to watch out for that, okay? Any urinary stimulants like alcohol and caffeine, um, if they're obese, uh, if they eat a standard American diet, if their father had BPH, if they have metabolic syndrome, so remember those signs and symptoms of metabolic syndrome, if they have diabetes or heart disease, and prosthetic, prostate cancer is not a risk factor for BPH. So you do need to know what the risk factors are. You need to know the signs and symptoms of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So you can use the mnemonic fun pissed. It's not fun, so now they're pissed, okay? So frequency, urgency, nocturia, poor stream. A lot of times they can't get the stream started, but then once they start, they may be able to go. It depends on where they are in their um, hyperplasia journey. All right, so they have trouble. Um, they have intermittency, like they get the void started, but then it stops, and then they have to get it started again. S is for sense of not being able to empty their bladder completely. S is for straining to urinate or they need to apply pressure. E is for ejaculation pain or pain upon urination. So they'll have dysuria. And D is for dribble and dysuria. Okay. The nursing implications, patient teaching regarding a PSA blood test. So with the PSA blood test, they can't ejaculate for 48 hours before. They have no food restrictions. It's offered at the age of 50, and you expect the PSA to increase with age. But anybody who has a PSA greater than 4, that needs to be investigated. Now, a high PSA doesn't always mean prostate cancer. It could be due to prostatitis or BPH. Okay, that's why it's in here. Um, if they had a UTI in the last six weeks, it can elevate the BPH. So they may get put on medications to help with BPH. Um, they may have what's called a TERP, transurethral um, prostatectomy. It's not really a prostatectomy, trans transurethral resection of the prostate. So what they do, the surgeon, goes in with a cystoscope through the urethra, and they kind of rotor rooter the prostate gland, okay? But, so the patient's going to have like, all these little shreds or all these little like tiny blood clots that they have to empty. So that's why they have a continuous bladder irrigation after TERP surgery. Okay, so um, we call it a Murphy drip. You might be hear that um, being called that. So it's bladder irrigation to remove the blood clots and ensure drainage of urine. Now this drainage should be clear to light pink. You should never see bright red blood in the Foley, you know, coming out of the uh, catheter in the Murphy drip. The procedure, um, the usually they use a three-way Foley catheter and it has a 30 to 40 ml balloon. Now, you probably know this, a normal Foley only has a 10 ml balloon. So this is a big balloon. And the reason they have such a big balloon is so it can hold traction on the surgical site. So you tape it to the patient's leg tightly. Okay, so your nursing implications, you're going to monitor the INO, keep the urine a rosé color by adjusting the rate of the continuous bladder irrigation, keep the three-way irrigation patent, administer antispasmodics and pain medication. Now, if your patient oftentimes, 
when I worked in the PACU, these patients, <laughs> it's like Groundhog Day anytime, anytime you're in the PACU, but these patients wake up with such an urge to void. They're practically climbing out of the bed when they wake up because they have to pee. Over and over again, you have to remind them they have a three-way bladder irrigation. Um, but if they start to complain about bladder spasms, that probably means that they have got a clot um, that is blocking the three-way irrigation. So you're going to have to disconnect the Foley or you're going to, how should I say this? You're going to have to um, irrigate with a 50 ml syringe, okay, with normal saline to get this uh, clot freed so that the continuous bladder irrig irrigation can do its job. If you can't get it out, you're going to have to call the provider and let them know so they can come and get it out. The urine output is measured by the return, so how much emptied in the bag minus the amount of solution irrigating in. So in other words, the irrigation comes in 3,000 milliliters and they hang it on like an IV pole. Look at my um, recordings of this because I have pictures of it and it will make more sense to you. Okay, and I describe how you do the INO there. You don't never want to see bright red blood. Um, so after a terp, they're um, going to be more prone to DVT. So make sure you apply this SCDs and do early uh, ambulation. Um, after the DC of the three-way catheter, the urine should turn amber within three days. No sex or heavy lifting for two to six weeks. Okay, so that's BPH. This is a rich um quizlet that has a lot of good information in it okay so now i'm going to talk about renal calculi so a renal calculi or nephrolithiasis are kidney stones so um kidney stones can be originated in the kidney or they can be and they can be found anywhere in the urinary tract but some can originate in the bladder and their urolithiasis you, it, it doesn't matter lithiasis means stone Nephro means kidney, uro means bladder, okay? Uh, stones can form for a lot of different reasons. Um, calcium stones are going to be the most common. So my guess is if you're going to get questions on NCLEX and on your proctor, it's going to be about calcium oxalate stones. So that's where I would focus my attention because there's a lot of different idi idiosyncrasies with each one. Um, but it's going to be too much to try to me memorize them all, okay? So calcium oxalate is the most common. And the foods, you because it's, you know, by eating these certain foods, they can create renal calculi. So you need to tell the patient to avoid or limit spinach, black tea, or just tea, cola, coca products, pecans, and rhubarb, okay? So that's like the important thing there. Um, now what you're going to worry about if somebody has a stone that it could obstruct the urinary flow and they could end up with an acute kidney injury and hydronephosis. So make sure you're looking at the videos because I have pictures of what that looks like. So you want patients to drink a lot of water each day to try to flush it out, flush out the stone. Um, you're going to strain all urine because if the person is coming in um, and the, the stone hasn't been sent to the lab to analyze it, that's why you're straining it. So you can send the stone to the lab so it can be analyzed so you know what kind of stone you're dealing with. Okay. Um, so the signs and symptoms you're going to see is the pain is going to, the patient is going to be in a tremendous amount of pain when they're trying to pass a kidney stone. I mean, women tell me that the pain is worse than childbirth. All right. And they, they may have hematuria. Um, they may get, these are the complications. They may get a kidney infection or bladder infection. They may get hydronephrosis, which is swelling of the kidney due to the buildup of urine, which can result in renal failure, which is why you need to act on it quickly. Um, the treatment of kidney stones is pain management, give a lot of fluids, um, stone analysis, so you would strain all urine. Now, once you have already sent all the stones to the lab, you don't have to strain anymore after you know what kind of stone it is, okay? Um, if the stones are small, 
they're going to let them allow it to pass. But if they're greater than one centimeter, they're probably going to have um, an extracorporeal shockwave lithotricity. And what you need to worry about after is dysrhythmias. So look for palpitations, dizziness, weakness. Um, a lot of times patients will tell you, I feel like my heart is racing. And it's jumping all over the place. So that's a good way to know. And then you have to strain the urine after the ESWL to determine if the stone passed. Okay. So remember, you're going to do discharge instructions and tell the patient to avoid high oxalate foods. All right, with renal function, I'm going to go over the wet bed. And the wet bed is a really good way for you to kind of figure out what goes on in the kidney and then what happens when the kidney's not working. So let me just preface this by saying an acute kidney injury is acute, obviously, um, but the oligoric stage of acute kidney injury is the same, has the same signs and symptoms as chronic kidney disease. So don't try to memorize a bunch of things. Just listen to what I'm saying about what's normal function of the kidney and what happens when the kidney can no longer do it because that's going to be your signs and symptoms of an acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease um, in the oligarch stage of acute kidney injury, which is when I'm doing ATI questions, that's what I see the most, those kind of questions. So... The kidney regulates acid-base balance, water removal, erythropoiesis, toxin removal from the body, um, blood pressure control, electrolyte balance, and vitamin D activation. So if the kidneys can no longer regulate the acid-base balance, they're going to have metabolic acidosis with Kuzbos. So that means they're going to have a low pH, usually a low pH, ACO2 and a low bicarb. The treatment for metabolic acidosis is to treat the underlying cause and for, for patients that are really sick and are not putting out any urine then they may need dialysis. Okay. What findings would the nurse anticipate if the kidney can no longer remove water from the body? These are your signs and symptoms of fluid overload. So the patient's going to have orthopenia, meaning they don't want to lie flat. They want to sit up. Um, they're going to have crackles. They're going to have tachypnea, tachycardia, cough, pink frothy sputum, shortness of breath, a low O2 stat, and feelings of impending doom. And a soccer means total body edema. Um, so they could have that. And vein, vein distension, which is jugular vein distension, usually. What action should the nurse take for a client experiencing fluid overload? Well, you're going to put the head of the bed up first, then you can put some O2 on them. If the patient is still producing urine, you're going to give probably furosemide. Morphine is a very good drug for pulmonary edema. Digitalis will help the heart contract better. Um, and then dialysis if the patient is not making urine. Now, they could be put on a fluid restriction, and the typical fluid restriction is going to be the urinary output for 24 hours plus 500 to 600 milliliters. So what that means is if my patient's urinary output is 2,000 mLs today, tomorrow they can have 2,500 to 2,600 mLs of intake. All right, if the kidney can no longer secrete erythropoietin, the patient is going to have anemia. So the signs and symptoms of anemia is tachycardia, dizziness. Um, they're going to be pale and tired. The medication for that is epoetin alpha, SC. And you need to monitor um, for hypertension and headaches. And you know, we, don't, we check the hemoglobin and don't give it for if it's over 11. All right. Which findings should the nurse anticipate if the kidney cannot remove toxins? Uremia. Uremia is one of those conditions where every single body system is affected. Okay? So uremia, um, the symptoms, every body system. But first, let me say this. If the, if the kidney can't... Um, Get rid of toxins, they're going to be at risk.
for adverse effects from their medications because they're going to stay in their body longer. So for example, a diabetic who is taking insulin or all medications, they're going to be more at risk for hypoglycemia because the insulin in the, or the drug is going to stay in their system longer. So you're going to have to do more frequent blood sugars. Um, somebody on DIG, you might start to see DIG to toxicity. So you have to you have to look for those kinds of signs and symptoms. Now, uremia affects every body system. Um, you're going to be lo uh, learning about the liver pretty soon, and some of these signs and symptoms are very similar, okay, because it's due to a buildup of ammonia because the kidney can no longer get rid of it. So it um, is neurotoxic. Okay, uremia is neurotoxic, so they they could be confused. They could have encephalopathy. Um, it is irritating to mucous membranes, so they can have stomatitis. They can have um, ulcers. They can have gastritis. Okay, they can have esophagitis. Um, it is also irritating to serous membranes, so they could have. Um, pericarditis, so you would hear a friction rub on the, you know, when you're listening to heart sounds, and they can have pleurisy, so when you're listening to lung sounds, you may hear a pleural friction rub. Um, uremia, they're going to have anemia, um, because, well, two reasons, you know, the kidney can't make your erythropoietin, but also when the BUN gets really high, red blood cells start to lyse, okay, that's a factor of that. Also, um, uremia makes the thrombocytes, which are the platelets, not work as well. So people with end-stage kidney disease are going to be at risk for bleeding. Okay, I would definitely look at the PDFs, um, especially in the video, especially a wet bed, so you can get a better idea about how uremia affects every body system. Okay, so if um, the kidney can no longer manage the blood pressure. Your patient's going to have hype, hypertension. And it's going to be managed with ACE inhibitors or ARBs if they can't tolerate those. Calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. So one thing you have to remember is in kidney disease, if the patient is oligurk or anurk, they're not going to be able to get rid of potassium. ACE inhibitors can make, and ARBs, can also make them hold on to potassium. So you have to watch the potassium level very closely. Um, which electrolyte imbalance should the nurse anticipate? If the kidney can no longer regulate electrolytes, you're going to see high potassium, high phosphorus, low calcium, high magnesium, and high sodium. So what that means is somebody with oligarch kidneys, acute kidney injury, or somebody with chronic kidney disease are going to have these labs. High potassium is treated with kind, and we went over this before, I can't remember on what lecture, but if it's a really high potassium, you're going to do insulin and dextrose first because that's going to work the quickest. Then they can get K-exalate um, and sodium bicarb. We don't really do that that much because it's a huge salt load but they may need dialysis or if they're still producing urine diuretics. Um, PO4 can lead to osteodystrophy, which can put them at risk for um, pathological fractures. So it could put them at risk for injury. So avoid high phosphorus foods. Um, they're going to need to take phosphorus binders with every meal and encourage calcium containing foods and vitamin D. The nurse should always avoid uh, and acids containing magnesium for patients that have kidney disease. So the conditions we're talking about that where this wet bed will um, kind of present the symptoms of if the kidney's not working are the oligarch stage of AKI, the oligarch stage of acute glomerular nephritis, which we're not going to even talk about for this exam, chronic kidney disease, polycystic kidney disease, which we're not going to really talk about for this exam at all. The thing with polycystic kidney disease, the only thing you really need to know, it's genetic. There's no way around it. They're going to end up with end-stage kidney disease. And these kidneys can grow huge, like up to 10 pounds. So you may see a mass on their back. Um, so the neurological signs of uremia, remember I said that it was neuro. Toxic, so they could have asteristics, which is called wrist flapping. 
they're going to be fatigued, they could have ataxia, they could have peripheral neuropathy, and they could have encephalopathy. So patients that have, are in the oligarch stage of AKI or have chronic kidney disease are going to be put on a low protein diet. Now the GI symptoms, this is due to uremia being irritating to mucous membranes. So they're going to have vomiting, anorexia, nausea, um, GI bleeding, stomatitis, gastritis, and something called fetter. Okay, fetter is actually um, musty breath. So they could have that. Um, hematological signs of uremia are anemia, bleeding, and infection. And the, what you're going to see on the skin is they're going to be itchy. They'll have yellow tan skin, and that's called sallow color. They'll have purple and petechiae because they're at risk of bleeding. Um, the skin is going to be dry and ashy, um, and they could have tinted skin. And then if the BUN and creatinine are really high, they can get a frost on their skin. Usually doesn't happen to patients that are undergoing dialysis, but there comes a point in the chronic kidney disease journey that a patient may choose to die and no longer receive dialysis, and that this is where you would see the uremic frost. An acute kidney injury is rapid loss of renal function, which results in a high BUN and creatinine, but it also results in a lower GFR. So the normal GFR is 125 mLs per minute, and that's the lab we go with. Now, really, as you age, this is going to go down, but we're just going to use this as our benchmarks. Benchmark, sorry. So people with kidney disease are going to have a low GFR and a high BUN and creatinine. All right. The causes of renal of AKI include pre-renal causes, intrarenal causes, and post-renal. So I'm just going. To, the most that you will encounter in your lifetime are going to be due to pre-renal reasons. 90% of the acute kidney injuries are due to pre-renal reasons. Okay, pre-renal means it's something in the vascular system, like for some reason the patient is hypotensive, so the kidneys aren't perfused. So it's anything that is going to cause decreased perfusion or a reduction in renal blood flow. Somebody's had an MI, their heart can't beat as much. They're going to have decreased perfusion to the kidneys, and that's an intrarenal AKI. Uh, I'm sorry, pre-renal AKI. Intrarenal causes include those drugs I already talked about, okay? Um, also, people with, like, lupus can have an intrarenal AKI. Diabetes, um, contrast dye can cause intrarenal AKI. Um, yeah, so here are your examples of intrarenal AKI. Medications that are toxic, I've already talked about that, you need to burn these in your memory, okay? Um, Post-renal causes include BPH, renal calculi, what I've been talking about. Post-renal AKI is due to an obstruction somewhere in the urinary system. Now with an AKI, there's different phases. Um, I imagine that you're going to be mostly tested on Algor, the Algor phase. So the onset, something is an insult to the kidney, some kind of, you know, they got medication, intrarenal, they had low blood pressure, that's the onset. So the creatinine rises up like 48 hours after the incident. Then they go through the oligarch stage, which I think you're going to be tested on the most, but they can all, then they go through a diuretic phase. And when, when they go through this phase, that means the kidneys are healing. And recovery can take up to a year. So it's really important to prevent this if you can. All right. So signs and symptoms that you should anticipate in the oligarch stage include all those signs and symptoms I talked about when I was introducing the wet bed. All right. The labs, you're going to have, this is the oligarch stage, high BUN and creatinine, low GFR, high potassium, high phosphorus, low calcium, high magnesium, low pH and low bicarb. Okay, when they go through the diuretic phase, they're going to put out large amount of urine. Your job is to keep up with the output because they're going to need fluids and you need to monitor the potassium because now, instead of worrying about hyperkalemia, you're going to worry about hypokalemia. All right, 
the difference between the oligarch phase of AKI and in the in chronic kidney disease is that AKI can present in different degrees and it could affect all the body systems, but CKD definitely affects all the body systems. Okay. They under there's five different phases. You don't really need to know the different phases, but it's in stage five. So the last five is end stage renal disease or end stage chronic kidney disease is when they either need to decide in stage four is when they make the decision, but this is when it happens. So they're going to decide either to have hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, um, a kidney transplant, or they may choose to die. That is uh, an option for them. Um, the nursing implications. So hemodialysis is given through a vascular access device. And this is super important that you know that whatever vascular access device, whether it's like this, a permacath, okay, with two, um, you know, ports here, one for venous, one for arterial, that would be a more temporary one. It's only used for dialysis. Nobody touches that but the dialysis nurse. You cannot administer IV fluids through it, no blood draws through it, only dialysis, okay? And then the nursing implications for somebody undergoing, you want to weigh before and after. Um, they're at risk for bleeding because you give a lot of heparin when you're doing hemodialysis. All right, and then um, if they have, um, they could get hypotensive. There's no eating during dialysis because that's going to bring the blood to the GI tract and the patient's going to get hypotensive. Anytime somebody gets hypotensive, put a black. Um, then if they get, if they have an atrovenous fistula, I don't know if you've seen one. I've had I have pictures on the videos, your tutoring videos, so you could watch that and you'll get more of a visual. But this is super important, okay? No BPs, IV fluids, or blood draws on the same side as the AV fistula. So the physician, the surgeon, creates an AV fistula by attaching a vein to an art, art, uh, artery. You're going to assess cap refill and pulses distal to the site. So essentially, you're doing your six P's on that hand that the AV fistula is on. When you come on your shift or you're working throughout your shift every four hours, you're going to auscultate for a brewery and palpate for a thrill. And that's to assess the patency of the fistula. So WA means while awake. You're going to encourage range of motion on that arm. They shouldn't, you know, not do anything with that arm. Instruct the patient not to carry heavy objects with that arm or wear anything like a watch, okay, that compresses the extremity or like a um, tight, tight clothing on that side. Instruct them not to sleep on the graft or fistula site and it needs to be cleaned properly before it's working. All right, the big thing with peritoneal dialysis is Peritoneal dialysis is good for people that want to travel, people that have the capacity to care for themselves, um, and there's going to be a little bit more protein loss, so they're going to need to eat more protein in the diet. They could get hypercalcemia, a hyperglycemia, because there's glucose in the, in the solution they use. Peritonitis is a big deal. Now, I go over peritonitis a lot, so if they're effluent, which is what is drained out, is cloudy, you're going to suspect peritonitis because it should just be straw color when it comes out. So you need to worry for that. Um, peritonitis, you're going to see distended abdomen. It'll be tender. The patient will guard. They'll have a high white count. They'll have a fever. Board-like abdomen or rigid abdomen, those are like the hallmark signs. Okay. Um, if you're having trouble getting the outflow to drain, okay, you need to make sure the bag is lower than the abdomen and the patient, you need to roll side to side and check for kinks and reposition the patient. So self-management, the patient needs to weigh themselves every day. They have to do it on a schedule, not just when they want to do it. Or if they're feeling good, not do it. They have to do peritoneal dialysis on a schedule. They could have respiratory distress when they're first starting to stretch the peritoneum out. Um, so watch for that. 
and they need to stay on their fluid restriction as prescribed and take their diuretics as prescribed. Um, so that's the scoop on urinary and renal that you're going to see on the exam three.